I have a great show for you today. I have former U.S. Air Force and former CIA intelligence officer, Andy Bustamante. Andy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, it's my pleasure, Stephen. I'm glad to be here. So uh, just to give some background, you served for several years in the Air Force. Uh, you were over the nuclear program. You were then recruited into the CIA and went abroad to places we're not allowed to talk about. Uh, where you served your country, you're now the founder and CEO of Everyday Spy. Um, we've, we've talked about the Russia-Ukraine situation. We've talked about Israel. I want to I wanna touch on those topics. Um, it, just, just in the last few days, Russian President Vladimir Putin was reelected, I believe, for the sixth time. Uh, Putin is now saying he wants the war to end, but he wants a large barrier between Russia and Ukraine, essentially like a natural border. He doesn't want Ukraine touching him. He doesn't want NATO touching him. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on how this war is going to end? Because on the one hand, it seems like NATO does not want this thing to slow down. On the other hand, it does seem that Russia is maybe ready to move on to other things. What, what are your thoughts on this situation? Yeah, so one of the things that you're seeing in the headlines right now is very much the kind of the climax of an information war. Now, when it when Russia first invaded back in 2022, um, one of the first predictions that I made in August of 22 was that the definition of winning and the definition of losing were something that was going to become a topic of conversation over time. If you recall, Zelensky said that he wasn't going to stop until Russia returned all of the original 1996 era uh, borders back to Ukraine, which include Crimea, Crimea, all of, uh, of Eastern Ukraine and beyond, right? And of course, Putin was saying, even then, even in August of 2022, Putin was saying, let's have a ceasefire. I'm happy to end this thing right now even though he had essentially taken over the Donbass region and, and, other, and the majority of Eastern Ukraine. Here we are two years later and essentially not much has changed, right? If anything has changed in the last two years, it's the, uh, it's the momentum of the war. For a while, the momentum was in favor of Ukraine and then they had a failed summer counteroffensive uh, in 2023. And now the momentum is very much back in favor of Russia, especially as funding for Ukraine uh, becomes contentious in the United States. They're having issues supplying military weapons and uh, ammunition. Europe is under pressure as well because of changing political feelings. Two years is a long time for the West to continue fueling a fight in, uh, in a, like Russia's backyard, right? So what we're seeing now is the continuation of an information campaign that started back in 2022. What does Putin mean when he says he wants a large natural border? What he's saying is he wants to retain rights to the eastern portions of Ukraine that he has controlled since the invasion first happened. Those same two areas that he annexed very shortly after invasion that the whole world said the annex was illegal. But two years later, most of us have forgotten that that annexation even happened. Now the world by default is looking at Ukraine and saying, well, Russia already controls 15% of Ukraine like it has for the last two years. So maybe that maybe that's not a bad deal. Ukraine, maybe you should uh, accept a ceasefire, accept some sort of end to this war, uh, even though your terms, Zelensky's terms of victory would not be met. Putin has never once claimed that he was going to invade and take Ukraine's sovereignty. He threatened it once. He never said that was his ambition. His ambition has always been to create a buffer so that NATO isn't up against you, uh, Russia's borders. And if he successfully uh, acquires and retains rights to Eastern Ukraine, he'll have that buffer zone that he's looking for. But the, the unfortunate truth that we all should be looking at here, that we should be accepting, is that what Putin said he would do two years ago hasn't changed. But what the United States and what NATO and what Ukraine said they would do two years ago has changed. And now you're seeing the, dem the democratic powers of the world backing down and you're seeing the authorita authoritarian power of Russia prove its might. 
Uh, and, and unfortunately, that is the true war that's happening here. That's the real East versus West conflict is watching as authoritarian regimes deliver on promises while democratic regimes fail to deliver on promises. Yeah. One of the one of the things that I've heard is the, the worst thing that has come out of this is pushing Russia and China uh, to becoming close allies uh, as you've traveled around the world, you know, there's this battle between who, who's going to be the biggest, baddest uh, controller of money and commerce? Is it the United States? Is it going to be China? And now China and Russia, I believe Putin, if he's not in China right now, he's heading there uh, for for discussion. Is that really the worst thing that's come out of this is, is that those two are coming together against the United States, against the U.S. dollar? Absolutely. The, the biggest the biggest loss in the European war isn't Ukrainian lives. It isn't Russian lives. It isn't even the threat to NATO or the threat to the spread of Russia. The worst part is we just exacerbated. We helped the, the alliance against the West, especially the alliance against the United States. We've helped them evolve decades worth of evolution in years. Right. And it's not just a, a, an alliance of friendship between China and Russia. Yes, we've seen that. But we've also seen the U.S. basically took money and, and held money that was uh, that belonged to the Russians, but was in European banks in an effort to try to put economic sanctions on Russia. In doing that, we showed the whole world that we are willing to freeze your funds if they're in our banks. And immediately after doing that, you started seeing the like world power started pulling their money out of US banks, converting their currency out of US dollars. Doing that is what led in large part to, to the inflation that we're suffering right now. And then it's not just about our enemies. If you classify Russia and China as American enemies, you also have other allies, people who have long time been allies to the United States, countries like India. India is the number one importer of, of sanctioned Russian oil right now, right? So India is somehow friends with the United States, but also willing to break the sanctions on Russia because it's looking for Russian oil to fuel its vehicles and fuel its own growth uh, economically. So what you're seeing here is that because of the choices that we made in the war in Europe to support Ukraine, to oppress Russia, to create a narrative that made it sound like Putin was weak, a narrative that made it sound like Putin was, uh, was going to be ousted from within, none of which have proven to be true. But because of all this effort that the West put into that narrative, that, that empty narrative, now what you end up having is this, this alliance of Eastern powers who have become economically independent on their own, and they no longer need to cooperate with the United States. That could have taken 10, 20, or 30 years, but instead it's happened in two years because of our decisions in relation to the Ukraine war. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think one of the things that has that caught me the most off guard was uh, as as a journalist trying to bring the truth. I started I started reading news outside of the United States and the United Kingdom, and my goodness, does it portray the United States and Putin completely the opposite? Uh, India, uh, you know, a lot of Asian nations. They, they look at Putin as this strong, powerful leader that they want to get behind, that he is the one that's going to lead the next 100 years. Yeah. And, and yet the United States keeps calling him the boogeyman so they can get military money. The United Kingdom keeps provoking him, sending in people, sending in these weapons. It, it like For me, it, it was just like, it was almost like uh, my brain couldn't hold these two differing opinions at the same time because it just wasn't prepared for that. And yet at the same time, it's been really interesting to see the world through non-American eyes. And it, it is different. Uh, the, the narrative is different. The vision of the world is different. That, that kind of caught me off guard. I'm sure as you lived abroad, you, you experienced some of that yourself. Right. What you're talking about right now is a, a condition that we call cognitive dissonance. When, when your rational brain comes in contact with rational arguments that make sense independently, but are at such contrary odds to each other, 
how do you make sense of two things that essentially seem factual? And that is exactly what you're experiencing because inside the United States and outside of the United States, all media starts to take on its own narrative because all media has its own bias. It's easy to, to cut to uh, attack um, centralized government and centralized media, like in Russia and North Korea and China, and just say, oh, your media is controlled by the government, so you have a narrative. The same thing is true here in the United States, with the exception that our media isn't controlled by the government. Our media is essentially controlled by the bias of the base of people who consume that media. So liberal media continues to produce liberal news for a liberal audience. And conservative media continue to create conservative news for a conservative audience. So even our media in the United States is incentivized to go further and further towards the fringe um, and abandon the center because it's trying to stay alive. It's, it's trying to run a business. And the demand isn't for moderate centrist news. The demand is for some sort of you know, alarmist far right or far left news. And that, especially compared to what happens with nationally controlled media coming out of China or Russia or even parts of India, when you put those two together, you have rational thoughts that do not make sense when they are put together. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Uh, I, I want to hit on China a little bit, but um, when Biden gets into office, he kind of lets the pressure off of Iran. China ends up going into Iran, signing this like $450 billion oil contract over the next two decades. Uh, I, I've been watching the, the Houthis uh, do their best to control the flow of ships and commerce in the Red Sea. They've had many skirmishes with the U.S. military. Uh, but now China has gone to the Houthis and, and said, listen, uh, we're, we don't want to fight you. You can fight the U.S. military, but we just want our ships to get through. We just want our, our money and commerce to continue to flow. And if you guys want to do trade with us like Iran, we're open to that. What, why, why does China see the world so different than the United States, where they're literally like they're taking over so many different parts of the world without any use of bullets or guns or tanks? What are your thoughts on this uh, Houthi situation with China? Yeah, what you're seeing here is uh, kind of a fundamental cultural difference between the Western or what we call the American model of economic development and the Eastern model of economic development. And this goes for China. This goes back 5,000 years. This is documented in Sun Tzu's Art of War. I mean, it's, it's centuries old compared to the United States' model which, I mean, we're not even 300 years old yet. So the two models are basically boiled down to this. The, the American model is very opportunistic. It developed out of World War II. The Nazis came in and basically destroyed Europe, right? They took over Poland, they destroyed France, they were, putting, they were bombing the hell out of the UK. So Europe was destroyed. The United States was safe for the most part. Yes, we had some attacks by the Japanese at sea, but there was no American city that was bombed by rushed by Nazi bombers, right? So we didn't have to rebuild our infrastructure coming out of World War II. If anything, we had a surplus of workforce. We had a surplus of engineering capability. We had a surplus of materials coming out of World War II. And we looked at our European allies who were broke and leveled. So what did we do? We chose an economic model that said, hey, we'll come in and help you. You can sign long-term leases. You can sign long-term loans. We are a debt. Uh, we're a country that runs on debt. So we have no problem extending lines of credit to you for the next 50 to 100 years. It's the Lend-Lease Act that we ran with the UK. So we created an opportunistic economic model that basically made it so we profiteered off of the rebuilding of a war-torn Europe after World War II. And when it worked, through the 1950s and 60s, we exported that same model to Africa and Latin America and Asia. And we basically said, hey, put yourselves in debt and we will help you build modern day infrastructure. That was our model. And the, the, prid, the quid pro quo was not only do you have to put yourself in debt to us, but you also have to adopt our ideals. You must become democratic. You must have free and fair elections. You must let us police your, your political process. 
And for, a, for countries that had no other options, of course they said yes to that opportunistic, forceful, um, almost brainwashing approach of, hey, we're, we're forcing you to adopt our ideology if you want our help. China has never operated that way. They've always operated from a very pragmatic foundational place. This helps you and it helps us. Therefore, we should do it. It's a good trade, right? I need corn, you need silk. I don't mind that, that you have a different ideology than I do. I can still trade corn for silk with you. So that's why China is willing to talk to the Houthis and treat them as a governing body, even as the United States reclassifies the Houthis as terrorists. So, and to the Houthis, put yourself in the shoes of a Houthi, you say to yourself, I've been fighting a civil war for five years. We are in control of the capital city of Yemen. What right does anyone have to, to classify us as terrorists just because we don't believe your ideology? Well, that's, what, that's exactly the conflict they're having with the West and with the United States. Meanwhile, China comes in and extends a hand and says, hey, we'll treat you like an equal, demo, or an equal country leader that just has a different political system than ours. And let's do trade. And that is exactly how China has made friends with Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Georgia, uh, Yemen, in, in the absence of the United States making friendships the same way. If anything, we've alienated many of our closest allies, like Saudi Arabia. Look at what we're doing with Israel now, because they will not, they will, because Netanyahu won't bend to the American president's will. Now, instead, he's like, okay, well, then let's just, let's let somebody else become president of Israel. That is the American way. That is the American process that has not been as refined as the Chinese pragmatic process because we're just not as old as that country. Yeah, I, I saw that, uh, you know, when, um, and I, I don't like either of these gentlemen, that, so these are just examples, but uh, Senator Lindsey Graham on the Republican side said, we need to take out Putin uh, and, and we need to have a regime change. And everybody was all over the top of him, right? And then, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, a Democrat, just said in the last week, it's time to remove Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, if somebody won't bend to the American way, as you say, then we need to get somebody else that will. Uh, and, and there's this uh, you know, back and forth uh, between the two. Um, it, it, it's so interesting because I, I keep thinking like um, NATO and Sweden just ended up joining NATO, right? Well, now the United States has can put military people there. They can put controls on on those countries. Meanwhile, from the from the Russian side, from the uh, not in America news, they're like, "What is going on? Putin didn't even have military on that border, and now he has to put military on that border. Now, now he has to become a threat because he feels threatened." It, it's just it's so interesting to watch this as an outside player trying to decipher the, the truth, what's right and wrong. And, and what, you, what you find is if, if you have an, a bigger lens, there's a lot more truth out there than, than just the American way of seeing the rest of the world. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, you're, you're getting to a long-term problem that exists in the geopolitical and, and military world where you have this situation where people are trying to defend themselves. Imagine two houses sitting on the same block right next to each other. Their neighbors, when nobody has security and nobody has any protective dogs and nobody has guns, they're just neighbors. Well, once one person puts an alarm system in their house, well, then the neighbor says, what does that person know that I don't know? And then they also put an alarm system on their house. Well, then meanwhile, the first neighbor sees the second neighbor put an alarm system on their house and they say, oh, well, my neighbor just put an alarm system on their house. That means I should get a guard dog. And then back and forth and back and forth. And they both get guard dogs. And then they both start getting signs that say, beware of guard dogs. And they both buy, buy guns and carry conceal, conceal permit weapons. And, and they're constantly in competition with each other for what reason nobody knows. And that's exactly what we're seeing happen now in Europe. People are countries are joining NATO for reasons that are tied to a narrative that was that was formed by the West, this narrative that Russia is going to take over Europe. When Russia was at its peak in the Soviet Union, it still wasn't trying to invade European partners, right? 
It was just trying to survive as a, as a group of Soviet states because Russia itself as a country only really has one resource. It doesn't have the ability to, to create a functioning long-term healthy economy. So it needs allies. It, need, it needed the satellite states in the USSR to survive. Putin is very aware of that. He still needs allies. He still needs uh, trading partners in order to keep Russia alive economically. Meanwhile, NATO doesn't recognize it as it continues to build up forces against Putin. Putin feels the need to build up forces against NATO. And we're once again in the same situation as these two neighbors who are investing in security infrastructure for reasons they don't even know. Yeah, man. Um, with, just with your military training, your CIA training, which, which war do you see potentially escalating into something much bigger? The, the Russia-Ukraine war, where we're told almost on a daily basis that Putin's going to invade you know, Europe? Or do you see this war that's, that's brewing becoming a, a, a powder keg in the Middle East? Which, which of the two do you think is more dangerous? You know, it's a great question. And uh, I would actually say that I don't see either war escalating much beyond its own borders. And I say that because what we're seeing both in Ukraine and in Israel is what's known as a proxy war. And Stephen, and I, you and I have talked about this before. This is modern day warfare. People who are saying, you know, has, is World War III coming? They're totally missing the point. World War III is already here. World War III is not going to be executed in the same way as World War II. It's not going to be threat of nuclear weapons and drills where you hide underneath your desk and, and large-term, uh, large-scale invasions of multinational forces coming into sovereign countries. That's not what World War III is going to look like. That's what World War II looked like. Wars evolve, just like World War II didn't look like World War I. The Korean War didn't look like World War II. Vietnam didn't look like Korea. Wars evolve and they change over time. Modern day warfare is about proxy warfare, which means you find uh, wealthy countries fuel, they, they spend money and they resource small proxy groups to cause havoc in other countries. That's what Iran is doing by funding Hamas in Israel. That's essentially what Russia is doing by invading Ukraine. There's a sovereign nation invading another sovereign nation, but the United States funding Ukraine is using Ukraine as a proxy to fight Russia. So the Ukraine war is really a war between the United States and Russia. No doubt about it. That's who's spending the money. That's who's, who's fighting the fight. The Israel-Hamas war is very much a war of Israel and Iran. And that's why Palestinians are being killed. And the whole world knows that that is wrong. But nobody is sitting around saying that Israel's actions against the Palestinians is correct. Even Israelis are saying it's inhumane. Because at a certain level, we all understand that Israel's really fighting Iran and, and the extremists that are funded by Iran, but we don't really have a word to describe that yet. The word that we're looking for is proxy war. So in both, in both instances, the reason I don't see them escalating beyond their borders is because once they escalate beyond their borders, they've morphed into something different and and Iran and the United States and Russia and Israel, all these countries want these wars to remain as proxy wars, not as regional wars. Yeah, uh, I, I think one of the most interesting things that I realized was the United States government um, pursuing Julian Assange from WikiLeaks, not because of what he shared, but the, the content, which was the United States doesn't want wars to end. They don't care how long they last as long as they're profitable. Uh, that, that, like, that was his great sin. And so these proxy wars, I've said this on my show, look at Joe Biden. He gets to look like a wartime president who never lost any American troops in the war, right? So he's, he's but meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of people have died in Ukraine and from Russia in this war that, that they don't really fully understand themselves. And the United States is, they're, they're making tons of money off the military industrial complex. He's, he looks like this uh, great supportive war leader. And yet he gets, his record gets to show that no American blood was spilled in, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. 
Um, I, I think it's incredibly confusing for a lot of people um, because they don't understand these proxy wars uh, and, and same thing going on. I think a lot of people are like, wait a minute, I want to support Israel and I don't want to see another Holocaust. Yet at the same time, what the heck is going on in Gaza? So many people have died. And, and this also feels really, really wrong. A again, it's it's like these two paradoxes that people are trying to hold in their mind, but it's incredibly difficult to do so. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, what we're seeing here is is the the most recent um, proof in the pudding, if you will, right? The most recent uh, ex example example of what Eisenhower warned us about when he was president. So Eisenhower, a five-star general coming out of World War II, specifically sent the American people a warning. He gave a speech telling Americans not to invest in the infrastructure of the military industrial complex. Do not let us become a warmongering state. Don't let us become reliant on a military industrial complex. And the reason he gave that warning was because he saw during World War II that we as Americans, as believers in democracy, as believers in equality, when we tie ourselves economically to a military industrial complex, what we're doing is we're creating a natural incentive for us to seek conflict and make conflict profitable. So you're exactly right, Stephen. As long as there is a war happening, the U.S. military industrial complex is churning and there will always be buyers for our weapons during wartime because you've got the countries that are in conflict buying resources. But then you also have all the other countries afraid of conflict coming to them who are also spending money. We are on the on the verge of, uh, of another possible government shutdown. Tomorrow, Friday the 22nd of March, there has to be a new bill passed in order to keep the government funded. Part of the terms of the bill that are expected are that military defense spending will increase by almost $70 billion over last year. So they're looking at a 3%, 3% increase in military spending in 2024 over what we spent in 2023 why? Why would America be spending more money on military defenses? We're not in a war. No one's threatening us. It's because we already know that we need more military because Americans are afraid of a threat coming to us. And that's where do you think that $80 billion is going to go? Right into the military industrial complex. And that military industrial complex is a big part of what feeds the U.S. economy. And that's why Eisenhower saw it coming, you know, 70 years early, and it's what we're in right now. Yeah. Okay, um, switching gears. This is kind of old news, but I, I still think it's really important. Um, just, just in the last week, General Mark Milley was um, subpoenaed to testify before Congress about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, you know, lots of lots of back and forth. But the, one of the main takeaways that I had was General Mark Milley essentially said that things went wrong because the State Department took over uh, the military operations and and whether to abandon Bagram Air Force Base, uh, whether to keep putting money into it instead of allowing the U.S. military to run their operations and develop an exit strategy that would keep people safe and, and appropriately uh, leave this war in, in our rear view mirror. What, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is he right in the fact that like Biden and the White House and the State Department tried to run this exit versus the US military? And that's why it ended so disastrously? Yeah, I mean, everything that I've seen and everything that my network tells me is essentially the exact same thing of what Milley is saying in front of Congress, which makes sense, because when you're called, when you're a general called in front of Congress, you're going to tell the truth. Biden and his administration was looking for a quick victory on the heels of Trump's uh, losing the 2020 uh, election, right? They were looking for how can we have a quick victory here that capitalizes on momentum? I mean, we're talking the peak of covid like a low economy, the stock market was crashing. It was a dark, dark time. And President Biden and his administration wanted some kind of quick win. And they knew that we wanted to, to call an end to the war in Afghanistan. Just like, I mean, uh, 
Trump's big victory during his administration towards the end was claiming that we defeated ISIS. So the Biden administration was looking for something similar. And that's why they wanted to, to be able to say, hey, we are the administration that ended Afghanistan, just like the Biden, or I'm sorry, just like the Obama administration was, hey, we're the administration that drew back forces. So Obama got to say, we started to reduce forces for the global war on terror. Well, Biden was Obama's vice president. So Biden takes office and he follows his boss's playbook and he's like, hey, we're going to end the war in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, in order to rush the withdrawal like that, you are you are doing the opposite of what every expert uh, who has been boots on the ground for the last 20 years of the global war on terror, what they are recommending, because you can't just abandon uh, bases like that. You can't you can't make promises to to local uh, volunteers who are your translators and your support staff. You can't make promises to them and then not have a plan to deliver on those promises. And that's how we ended up leaving some 80,000 uh, Afghans behind to be to be hunted by the Taliban even to this day. I mean, it was a massive failure on the part of the United States when we abandoned Afghanistan like that. And uh, because it wasn't the victory Biden was looking for, it was one of the big reasons why he was totally happy to then direct all public attention to Ukraine and Russia. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I didn't... Uh... I didn't pick up on that. Uh, but one of the observations I had was, I think they were literally trying to plan like, hey, let's have this upcoming September 11th be like, we're out of Afghanistan. It's a big party, almost like the end of every Star Wars movie, right? Where everyone gathers, the music's extra loud, there's awards given out, and yet it ends up being a total disaster. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like, Nobody, nobody is going to be held accountable for this. How did this happen? And, and, and I thought it was the U.S. military. And then now as General Milley is, is coming out, he's not being paid anymore to, to, to you know, cover for Biden. He's like, wait a minute, you guys took this over. You gave this, this military base to China. You, you are the ones that caused this horrible withdrawal. And we end up looking like the idiots in the military and, and so my observation was that they were trying to have this really great 9-11 anniversary. And then he doesn't even go to the anniversary. Uh, you know, he's so embarrassed. But I, I never thought about that just immediately rolling right into the Af or to the, the Russia-Ukraine distraction. Uh, that, that's really interesting. Um, and that's really that's what that's what politicians are always looking for. They're always looking for the next crisis that can divert attention away from their most recent failure, right? And if you think about it, that's COVID was the crisis that got people to look away. And then when we didn't, when we were unhappy with how COVID was being carried out, now all of a sudden we have Ukraine, Russia. That's the crisis to distract us from COVID. And then just as we get unhappy about Russia, Ukraine funding, Israel and Hamas breaks out. So that distracts us from Ukraine and Russia. Just if you just count headlines, Count headlines on major uh, major left and right leaning news sources. You can actually watch the number of articles change as American interest changes in whatever the flavor of the week is. A big part of the reason why we're even debating funding Ukraine right now is because we've had enough time now to let ourselves be distracted by other things. We were distracted by fears of a recession. We were distracted by health fears. Uh, of our politicians. We were distracted by Ukraine, I'm sorry, by Israel and Hamas. Then we became distracted by, by reclassifying the Houthis as terrorists. So, I mean, the average American is sitting there wondering like, who, what is our top priority as a country right now? Because everybody seems to be a little bit bad and we're not doing a whole hell of a lot to fix anything. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, no, it's... Uh... I'm trying to remember there was a comedian who was like, you know, everyone's so damn depressed because every day it's like a new emergency, right? Like it used to be one, then you could take a breath, go live a good life, and then a new emergency. And it's like every single day there's something coming up. I, I, somebody said to me the other day, you know, what are you going to do when this YouTube thing runs out? And I'm like, listen, unless the news stops, like I'm never out of a job. I have to decide what to cut out of the day not what to put into the day because there's just so much news going on every day. 
Um, okay, final final question. Um, you did an interview with Brian Rose from London Real, uh, and you talked about how if you want to control somebody, get into their private life. Is uh, help me understand what you meant by that. Is this something that uh, the the CIA does in order to gather information around the globe? What 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 were you what were you meaning by that? Yeah, so you're exactly right. We're what the the topic at hand is how do you gain someone's trust to a place where it's more than trust, it's actually loyalty, right? Essentially, how do you motivate or manipulate or ingratiate yourself to someone else so much so that you can count on their loyalty? And it's it's super powerful when you're a salesperson. It's super powerful if you're a business person. It's super powerful if you're trying to build a relationship I mean, even if you're just trying to, to determine whether or not to propose to a woman or say yes to a, a, a potential suitor, to understand that they are loyal to you, not just they like you, not just they trust you, but you can count on them to be loyal. So CIA teaches us that all human beings have three lives. We have a public life, a private life, and a secret life. So the one thing that you didn't quite say correct is that it wasn't that we need to get into someone's private life to win their loyalty. You win their loyalty by getting into their secret life. So what I mean by that is publicly, we all create a public persona. This person that we're comfortable with the masses meeting and knowing. Anybody out there who has slapped a smile on their face when they don't really feel like smiling or said nice things to somebody who they don't really like or who's dragged their ass out of bed in the morning to go to a job that they hate, to put all this energy into doing a good job at this job that they don't like, or this job that doesn't appreciate them, or this job that doesn't challenge them. All of Everybody who's lived in that world understands what it's like to have a public life. That's not who you really are. That's what the face you put on for the general public. We also, each of us, has a private life. That private life is the life that only our closest friends and peers really know. So think about your family, your kids, your cousins, your brothers and sisters, your best friend, right? The general public doesn't know your feet stink, but your best friend might know your feet stink. The general public doesn't know that you don't really like soy sauce, but your friends know that you don't like soy sauce. That's your private life. We only let a few people into our private life and we start to trust people in our private life. But that doesn't mean we're loyal to those people because the people who are in our inner circle change over time. Every two or three years, we might have a friend come and a friend go, a new friend made, an old friend lost. The magic really happens when you get into someone's secret life. And the difference between your private life and your secret life is that inside your secret life, that's the place where you keep all of your deepest, darkest secrets. Those things that you're embarrassed about, the things that you are uh, that you condemn yourself about, your the things that you're humiliated by, the memories that you don't share with anybody, the dark secrets, the dark preferences that you are too embarrassed or ashamed to talk about. We all have a secret life. We all do. We all have things that we would only ever do in a dark room, in private, with nobody else awake. We have that life. Every one of us, right? What you do in that room, totally up to you. But the shame and the embarrassment and the humiliation that you feel about what's in that room, that is something that's personal to all of us. When you can get somebody to let you into their secret life, when you can get someone to share the thing that they're the most ashamed of or someone to share the thing that, that they're most fearful of, when you get someone to share that fact with you, that becomes someone who is more than a friend. That becomes someone who trusts you and is, trusts you so much that they are actually loyal to you for the entirety of your life. If you think about it, if, if you have one close friend that you know is going to be your best friend forever, chances are they have seen your secret life. They know that thing you're afraid of, that thing you're ashamed of. They may have even participated in it with you. And that is why you are so incredibly loyal to them and they are so incredibly loyal to you. What CIA teaches us is that you, there is a process that you can follow, just like a checklist that gets you into anybody's secret life. And that's the process they teach us because in order to collect secrets from somebody, in order to turn a foreign 
patriot into a foreign trader, you have to know exactly how to get them to express the thing that they're most secretive about with you. Because once somebody shares the thing that they're the most ashamed of with you, it's way easier for them to talk about secrets with you. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Um, let's see. I, I wanted to better understand something. Um, oh, shoot. It was basically, um, oh, when, when, when people in the CIA go undercover, I mean, like deep undercover, not connected for years, uh, you, you have your, I guess, mar marching orders, for lack of a better word, you get involved in this new life, this new persona. How do you, how do you not lose sight of the mission that the United States or the CIA has sent you on when you start to build friendships and, and get secrets and live this other life? How do you mentally stay strong? Uh, I, that's something I've wanted to understand. You know, it's funny that you asked that because the, the very conundrum that you're talking about is the reason why in real life, spies do not go that deep undercover in the United States. What you're talking about is it's what's known as an illegals program, basically, like what the what the Germans used to do against us and what the Russian, the KGB used to do against us. You would send somebody in deep cover and they might be inactive for years, building up their cover before they operate. The United States doesn't work that way and they don't work that way for a number of reasons. One, it's too expensive. Just think about we can't even pass a budget to keep our government open for the rest of 2024. How in the hell is anybody going to agree to fund an operation for three years where nothing really happens? So budget wise, the, the whole idea of deep cover illegal operations is totally you know foreign to anybody who signs the checks for the United States intelligence community. So there's a very real fiscal limitation. But then there's also the operational risk side of it, which is what you're talking about, Stephen. We are so careful to make sure that our field officers, no matter what their operational intent is, no matter what their priorities are, we have to make sure that they remain loyal to the mission. So we don't give them the flexibility or the freedom to fall off the map. We don't give them the freedom to go months or even weeks without communicating. Instead, we build an infrastructure where you are constantly checking in, constantly making updates, constantly making operational progress. If you can't make operational progress, then we have to abandon the operation. The risk is too great um, from the eyes of the intelligence community to let a field officer run an autonomously for too long. So instead, we're always kind of trapped in a six to 12 month um, budgetary cycle. So if you can't make operational progress in six to 12 months, then the whole machine starts to break down and they just reassign you. The, the movies make it look like you have these deep cover officers, but the, the, the actual DIA, CIA, DOD spies of the world, we in our culture in the United States, the risk is too great that someone might get distracted and not provide the return on investment we expect. So we don't take those risks, even though... Chinese and Russian and terrorist groups absolutely invest in in those deep cover cells all the time. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I, I was I was just thinking like I, I you know two three years in I'd probably start living that new life. You know I I went to church with a guy who was a uh, undercover police and he had to break into one of these drug gangs and he you know the long beard he got tattoos and and three years in he mentally he couldn't not be in that group anymore. He, he got really, really sucked into it. So um, now you've, you've learned a lot of skills with the military. You've learned a lot of skills with the CIA. You've deployed both of them. Uh, you now teach people over at Everyday Spy uh, how to do that. Tell us, tell us a little bit about Everyday Spy. Yeah, absolutely. So Everyday Spy is my company. Uh, it's, we're a digital company. So it's actually everydayspy.com. And we teach spy skills that break barriers in your personal and professional life. So whether you're trying to learn how to negotiate better uh, in your job or as a business owner, or whether you're trying to keep your family safe and understand the differences between modern day technology and how to keep yourself safe uh, cyber wise or digitally or even in your home, we use real world spy skills, spy tools and spy techniques to help people break those barriers and live the life they want to live personally and professionally. Okay. I'm going to put that down below. And then you have a, a YouTube channel where you do 
I believe individual videos, but also your wife joins you and you guys go in, you know, deep on, on different topics. What, what is the name of that YouTube channel so I can point people towards it? Yeah, absolutely. We are fortunate to have a very popular podcast called the Everyday Spy Podcast. You'll find that on YouTube and anywhere else that you listen to podcasts. And then you'll also find my own personal podcast channel at Andrew Bustamante whenever you are on YouTube. Okay. And and folks, you can uh, just search his name. He's got some of the biggest videos on YouTube, tens of millions of views going even deeper into some of these topics. Uh, Andy, thank you so much for coming on today and helping us understand what's going on through the lens of a military mind, a, a former spy mind, someone who's lived abroad. Um, thank you for that. And I'll make sure to leave those links down below. Thank you so much, Stephen. It was great to be here, brother. Thanks.